Welcome to episode number 104 of the PR Maven podcast. My guest is Carl Strand, General Manager at Sugarloaf. Carl was promoted to the position of Sugarloaf's General Manager in April of 2015. Carl has held a leading role in managing key segments of Sugarloaf's operations, as well as those of its sister resort, Sunday River. He began his career at the resorts in 2004 when he was hired as Vice President of Lodging and Property Management for both resorts. Most recently, he was the Vice President of Mountain Operations at Sunday River. Carl has been a sugar loafer since 1987 and first realized his love for skiing during his early years when visiting Sugarloaf and areas throughout Maine and Vermont. After graduating from Bryant University, he entered the lodging industry and soon discovered his passion for food and beverage operations, which led him to work in fine dining venues in nearly every region of the United States and toward his completion of studies at the Culinary Institute of America in Poughkeepsie, New York. That experience and education introduced him to opportunities for various executive positions in the resort and restaurant industry. In 2004, his desire to be in the mountains of Maine led him to Sugarloaf and Sunday River, where he has become seasoned in nearly all aspects of resort operations. He currently serves on the board of trustees of Carabasset Valley Academy and is the president of Ski Maine. Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I've been strengthening brands through PR for over 35 years, and now I'm celebrating the success of executives, influencers, business owners, and entrepreneurs from all around the world, all of whom have cultivated their brands and broadened their networks through traditional and digital networking methods. Each week, I interview one of these interesting and influential individuals and provide an opportunity for you, the PR Maven Nation, to gain insights from their strategies and stories. So stay tuned for this week's episode, and thanks for listening. So Carl, tell us about your career and how you got into it in the first place. Well, um, I think I was influenced primarily by my parents, especially in the hospitality field, because when I was young, we used to go to restaurants all the time. My parents would seek out restaurants around where we lived, and they loved to travel, so I enjoyed that. Um, And then I went to um, Bryant University, studied business. There's some hospitality in there, too. Then after that, I uh, went to uh, Maui, and I was in a management training program with uh, Weston Hotel, so I did that for a couple of years. I like that. I ended up being the uh, night auditor, which uh, was fun. I worked at night and ski and surfed during the day. wasn't so bad. But then uh, I decided I wanted to go see Europe, so I got a year rail pass and I went to Europe for about a year, and I got some odd jobs and so forth. And uh, I wanted to go to school in Lucerne for a hotel, but the it was about a three year waiting list, so I decided to go to the CIA. Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. And uh, so I studied that. I got a job down in Manhattan after that at Le Cirque Restaurant, which was one of the better restaurants back then. Uh, probably still is. They're still around. Uh, under Chef uh, Danielle Baloud, who still gets a lot of awards. So that was a great learning experience. I really learned how to cook from, from not only from him, but everybody around me. You know, I was French-inspired, learned to do that. Then I got married, and I was working for uh, my ex's uh, uh, aunt and uncle, and they owned a chain of gourmet food stores in Fairfield County. So I did that for a while. But uh, this whole time, I've always been uh, infatuated with Sugarloaf. I had a friend of mine who you know, uh, Jim Costello, who had got a job up at Sugarloaf, and uh, we were high school buddies. So a bunch of us high school buddies would go up every year, go skiing, and in the summer we'd go rafting, and play golf, and I got to love Sugarloaf, and I knew John Diller, who uh, was the GM previous to me, and uh, after after that, when I got married, my kids went up there, and we had family vacations, and 
All three of my boys learned to ski there. And so I just had this connection. So after heyday, um, uh, after my divorce, um, John called me up and he said, hey, would you like to come up and, and work and run our lodging and our F&B? And I thought, that'd be great, Sugarloaf. And he said, uh, no, it's Sunday River. And I'm like, where's Sunday River? I've never been to Sunday <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of that place. <laughs> but it worked out great. I loaded the kids in the car. They fell asleep right away. And That and, was a good thing. <laughs> yeah, so I started working up at uh, Sunday River. And then I ran the lodging, F&B there. And then I did it both resorts, Sunday River and Sugarloaf, for a while. I was doing sales. Uh, I did security. Uh, did a whole bunch of different things. And then I uh, actually did um, mountain operations at, at Sunday River. John, John re, uh, decided to retire, so I applied for that job, and I got that job at Sugarloaf, which is great, five years ago. That's a great story. Well, we have so many things in common because I told you I majored in French in college, and I also lived in France for a year, my junior year of college. We both also have sons named Craig who both That's went right. to Colby. That's right. <laughs> And uh, yeah, just our love of sugar. Well, I also. met you years ago, right? Yeah, We're that's right. Mutual friends. Exactly. We've known each other for a while. Yep. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a real long time. Yeah. So you kind of came up through the ranks, a, 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 sort of a different track, I think, than many ski area management people who typically come up through more of an operations yeah, that's true. side. And I think that ha- having a hospitality background is probably a very good thing. Well, one, one thing Boyne put together, and I think I was the first one to go through it, was they uh, wanted to do this uh, uh, management ascension program where you, as a, a potential GM, you would work in different departments that you may not have experience with. And that was why I, I got the job at, at Sunday River in the mountain operations for about two and a half years, which was great. It was fun. Got to ski and r- drive around in a, in a, motor, in a um, snowmobile all the time. But it, 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 you learned a lot, too. We also put in a, a lift. We did a lot of um, snowmaking improvements. So I learned a lot about the nuts and bolts kind of on that side of the business and also competitions and ski school and that type of stuff. Yeah, I think that's really great that you had had experience in all the different aspects of running a resort. I know that when I worked in the ski business, I used to always talk to the media about how a ski resort is made up of all of these micro businesses. There's so many different aspects to running a ski resort. And I think that the general public underestimates Oh, absolutely. How complex it is, really. Especially at Sugarloaf, because, you know, we're going to probably talk about that, but Sugarloaf's a community. You know, we have partners there. We have a great relationship with the town, CVA and the ski club, and all the other partners around that community. And it really is a community. Um, So, you know, you you deal with um, political issues, town issues, school issues, everything else. It's really just running a little town, which is exciting, but it it creates such a sense of community, which I think is what, you know, sugar loafers are all about. They're so passionate about being a sugar loafer, but not just about the mountain, but the whole community there. Well, it's a blessing and a curse probably for you because every skier who has grown up there and many are multi-generation, they almost act like they own the place, right? I mean, oh, they definitely do. (laughs) Don't mess with their ski area. I have a lot of bosses. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but but I think it's awesome because, you know, the passion there is great. And, uh, you know, I listen to everybody, you know, that comes along. You know, some there's some great ideas. There's some ideas that, you know, are marginal or so. <laughs> but I try to listen to everybody because there is a passion there and you want to embrace everybody's ideas. Well, I think it's very good that you're a good listener because I think a lot of people just want to be heard. <laughs> well, we also have, you know, it's a lot of people that – um you know, are very successful in their careers and they go up there and they ski there and they live there. So there's a lot of knowledge too. So sometimes I just, I gleam some of that too. That really does help manage the whole place. Well, I I do have to confess that, you know, since I started my business in 1991, Sugarloaf has been sort of my secret weapon as far as networking, because really everybody from Maine, who's, you know, a successful business person and even political leaders like Angus King, people go there on the weekends. So you have the opportunity to do a lot of really good networking. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely. I think they come up to kind of escape, too. 
So I don't really want to be, you know, recognized. And Angus just he sits out on the beach and just looks at, he looks up on the mountain, watches people ski, and no one bothers him. It's awesome. But, Except he uses those pink ski poles. And I <laughs> tried to tell him, Angus, you got to lose those pink ski poles. You know, when we had the ice storm, I think that was 1993, uh, we did a little, uh, public service announcement and it happened that Johnny Mosley who was a big freestyle oh, sure. champion was there for the US freestyle championships and we decided to have Angus and Johnny do body double so we took them both into the ski shop and we got them identical ski outfits and uh so <laughs> Angus took off as if he was going to jump and then he morphed into Johnny who did like a triple backflip <laughs> and then morphed back into Angus at the bottom <laughs> but I'll never forget Get when Johnny first saw Angus that morning with his pink poles, <laughs> and Johnny was like, <laughs> "I'm going to do body double." <laughs> That's funny. But Angus has always been proud of his pink poles. <laughs> he's, a, he's a good skier too. Yes, he is, and uh, and he gets out early, and then he spends a lot of time reading, which I admire about him too. Yeah. So, Carl, you studied hospitality management, was a, which was a different path. Um, when did you get the idea that you might want to run Sugarloaf? Well, I think it was through that uh, the management training program with Boeing. Yeah. Um, and then I knew I know John really well, John Diller, um, and I knew that he was looking to retire. Um, so it just seemed like a great opportunity. I've been going to Sugarloaf since 1987. I love the place. That's where I go to vacation. And I just thought it'd be great to be able to, uh, get a job there and, and help be part of that culture. And I think my job there isn't re not to really change it. It's already been there. It's just not to mess it up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I realize, Carl, that we've kind of jumped ahead. Yeah. We've talked about the value of having such passionate skiers, but what I'd like to talk about is um, engaging skiers of all ages, mm -hmm. both in person and on social. So that's a little deviation, but I think you can. Sure. Um, you know, uh, I think you and I were talking earlier about, you know, um, the different generations and what they use now whether it's social media and some people still looking at billboards and magazines and getting their information or their marketing. And um, funny thing, I, you know, some of the old-time sugar lovers will come in, you guys don't advertise anymore. I never see a billboard. There's nothing in the paper. And I said, well, do you have, you know, do you have a Facebook account? Or something? <laughs> and, well, I don't do that. You know, so, but the younger, you know, obviously the younger generation that are using apps and social media, and that keeps changing all the time too. So we have, you know, our marketing team is devoted to doing that and trying to, um, you know, but not only put our message out there, but engage with everybody that using all those different kind of social media. So I do think that's the way it's going to go. It's obviously people are making purchasing decisions now with their phone that they didn't used to. And, you know, we have less and less people calling. They're just purchasing that way. And one of the things that we're going to have this that we're putting in this year, which I think is further along in your questioning too, sorry, <laughs> is RFID ticketing, which um, Bloom did last year in Sunday River and Sugarloaf are going to do this year. So it allows you to purchase online. You can you can, you can can reload your, your ticket stock. Basically, it's a chip. Uh, online or through your phone. So you don't even have to go to the window anymore to buy tickets. Um, so that's, that's another thing that technology is doing just to – not only improve the experience, but also just allow people to uh, get information differently. Well, and of course, people will love to track how many runs they took and how many lift rides and which which parts of the mountain they skied on. Oh, so absolutely. It's a little bit like fishing. You know, you like to be able to brag about yeah. <laughs> how much you skied. And Yeah, we actually have an award every year, whoever skied the most. And it's called the Paul Schiffer Award, Schiffer right? Paul Schiffer Award, yes. Yeah, so I was involved with, you know, when I first started working at Sugarloaf for Chip Carey, you know, I was involved with telling the Paul Shipper story. And for those who aren't familiar, he never missed a day of skiing for, I think, 20, yeah, 20 plus years. years. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so even, it, you know, if 
he was sick. I mean, one time he actually had to drive to Poughkeepsie, New York, because his son also went to the Culinary Institute and right. he had to go to his graduation. So he, he went up and Crusher, who <laughs> uh, was then grooming, you right. know, drove with the 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 grooming machine. Right. And so Paul skied down in the headlights. and So he could get the run in. Exactly. Yeah. And then there was another time he actually had some cancer and had to have an operation, but he made an agreement with his doctor that he would wait till after ski season oh, before he had his operation. So he went through extraordinary lengths to ski every single day. And actually, it became almost like a compulsion. Right. Towards the end, actually, we had to orchestrate a phone call with Chip, who had then left Sugarloaf and had moved out west, but uh, it was almost like Chip had to give Paul his blessings right. to end the streak because Paul felt like it was his obligation to because it, it was a big PR thing right. for Sugarloaf that he kept skiing every oh, day. That's awesome. Yeah, so I learned actually about what I now call personal branding mm -hmm. in that whole experience of promoting Paul over many many years, and actually I. During COVID, one of the things I've been doing is culling out some photographs I have from back in those days. And I had a big stack, of probably 50 photos of Paul's different escapades. Right, and... He just got into the Ski Hall of Fame, too, right? And that's you, right. And you announced it. Yeah, you got that's out there and right. Talked. That was great. <laughs> yeah. So I just sent a big stack of photos up to Jeff Shipper, Paul's son, and uh because I still like to write letters and send them in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jeff sent me back a note, and we were kind of just remembering um, how awesome those days were. When I first moved to Sugarloaf, actually, I lived at the Lumberjack Lodge, which Paul owned, because I didn't even have a place to live. So uh, <laughs> every night, Paul and I used to like talk about the conditions that day, and he had a journal he kept, and where he logged how many runs he had taken and what the oh, conditions were. So, yeah, that was quite an experience. He was quite a, quite a guy. So, Carl, the Sugarloaf logo is a very powerful symbol. Like when you're driving down the highway in Maine and you see somebody with a Sugarloaf sticker, you kind of know they're a certain kind of person, that they love life, they're passionate, they don't mind driving a little farther for better skiing and uh since you're in charge of the brand, do you get involved with managing how the logo's used? Um, the marketing department does most of that. You know, I get involved if there's a request for a new use, you know, if somebody wants to put it on, whatever. And I, you know, if there's a new T-shirt or, or, or some other company wants to do it, I do get involved in that decision process. Um and I get involved when there's a copyright infringement <laughs> with something, something, which happens quite a bit. We will find somebody online selling a, one of our t shirts or one of our logo shirts that has nothing to do with us. So, yeah, that happens a lot. You know, like you said, the logo, I mean, people, you see them all over the world, really. But uh, when I go to conventions, sometimes I, I talk to other GMs and they're like, will you stop putting your logo <laughs> for our reason? I go, it's not me. <laughs> but but I, it's been on TV. It's been in movies, the logo, um, you know, just in shots on cars. It's pretty neat. Um, so, yeah, it's an iconic symbol. Unbelievable. and. It yeah. is. When I'm talking about powerful brands, I'll talk about the Sugarloaf brand and I talk about the Harley brand, actually, because they're similar in that they they sort of symbolize somebody who's living passionately, living for adventure right. and freedom. And um, so I definitely feel like Sugarloaf's logo is um, it's also so simple. I mean, right. it really is a very simple logo, sort of like, you know, the Nike swoosh. If you... If you hired a graphic artist and they made that swoosh, you'd say, well, you know, that looks like a <laughs> kindergartner could have created it. But that's actually part of the beauty of it right. is in its simplicity. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So, of course, at one point it was Sugarloaf USA. Yeah. And then you at one point, I don't know, that might have been when you were still at Sunny River that it went just back to Sugarloaf. Well, that's another funny story. So it was USA. Right. Back in the seventies, right when they had the the was it the World Cup, the which, Tall Timber the Classic, tall timber classic. Yeah. and um, so when Boeing purchased us, I think it was Boeing USA was their tagline. Even though I think they changed it to Boeing now, so um, the owner said, "Well, you have you know, let's change, take the USA out of it because that's confusing." 
which a lot of people didn't like. You know, obviously yeah. still don't like this day. And I know the people have stickers, save stickers with the USA still on it. So uh, Stephen Kircher, who's the owner, he was, I was showing him uh, an old photograph that Betsy Bass did, you know, with the, 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 uh, the old uh, gondola cars. And, uh, and if you look on that, it has two of them have USA stickers and one has Sugarloaf. So before it was USA, it was Sugarloaf like it is now. So he said, well, I'm, I'm making it retro again back to this. <laughs> I, I couldn't have that argument with him anymore to go back to USA. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. Well, there again, I'm sure a lot of people have opinions. And, uh, you know, I know that my kids who are in their 20s, they still they still connect with the USA. Oh, absolutely. A lot of people do. Because, yeah. yeah, that's what it was when they were coming up through. I'll, I'll still try to get it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, there will be some people who think you should and then some people who think you shouldn't. <laughs> so it's almost a no-win. <laughs> well, we're going to continue our conversation with Carl shortly. But first, I want to tell you about my new book, which is called Grow Your Audience, Grow Your Brand. And actually, I have a story in there about the Sugarloaf brand. Uh, in my new book, because I just feel that the Sugarloaf brand uh, just represents such a feeling and passionate. You know, a, a great brand is something that people resonate with, not only in their head, but in their heart, too. And there's something that you just can't put your finger on. It's just a feeling uh, that that connects the, the Sugarloaf people together. And I just think it's a really uh, iconic brand. And so I wrote about it in my book. So uh, we're going to be giving away a free Kindle version of my book if you go to prmaven.com slash giveaway. And we'll be back in just a moment with more from Carl Strand. Do you want to grow your client or customer base? Perhaps increase brand awareness? Maybe tell your unique story more effectively? Of course you do. But you may be worried that you don't have enough expertise to make that happen. Well, no worries, PR Maven Nation. Let the PR maven herself, Nancy Marshall, show you how easy it is to get your message across effectively using a powerful yet simple tool, a message map. Nancy's training is often called informative and constructive, well-designed and impactful, with a perfect blend of theory and real-life experience. You will leverage Nancy's expertise to create your own message map when you register for this comprehensive online video training course, which is broken down into four easy-to-understand modules. Normally, this course is priced at $147, but for listeners of the PR Maven podcast, that's you, PR Maven Nation, it's only $29 when you enter the code word PODCAST during enrollment. It even includes a workbook and bonus content to guide you through the process. So go to prmaven.com and click on the Message Map Mastery course to enroll today. Remember, enter the word podcast during enrollment for a special discounted price of $29. Welcome back. And today we're talking with Carl Strand, who's general manager at Sugarloaf. I'm going to dive right back in with more questions. I feel like there's so much we could talk about. Uh, Carl, how do you communicate the values of the Sugarloaf brand to your employees and loyal stakeholders? I think uh, we we largely communicate that, uh, you know, the values of the brand through how we our actions, how we operate our business and so forth. Uh, for our employees, um, we have uh, we introduce those values at our orientations every year. Uh, we also have follow-up emails and so forth that we communicate with them. We have a website that we talk about. Well, it's a, more like a Facebook site where they can go on and look about what's happening and so forth. So that's how we try to communicate them uh, with them. I try to walk around, meet with people. I, I uh, There's a lot of uh, departmental meetings that I'll stick my head in and talk about and listen to what's going on. So I think that's how we do it with you know, the employees, which seems to work pretty well. Um, and then with our um, – our stakeholders, um, we do similar things. We I have an advisory council that um, meets three or four times a year, um, and what I call it is the unofficial uh, grapevine because <laughs> you know in Sugarloaf there's the the grapevine. I heard this, <laughs> you know, I heard this. Most of it's not true, so I try to do is get a representative from each local groups and so forth, and then 
we talk about what's happening and, and I hope I hope that that assimilates back down to whoever there, and then they can bring whatever the concerns are up to us. It's like the work. Congress. Yes, yes. <laughs> See, it's very informal, though. We 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 do uh, we do first track skiing and then have breakfast. I <laughs> so, know. I sometimes <laughs> see you over there at Bullwinkles because sometimes if it's cold, I make one run and I end up <laughs> skiing over to Bullwinkles. <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes so, call it a day after that. <laughs> so it, I try to keep it fun, and then we have um, area business meetings. Um, you know, probably well in the seasons monthly sort of or every other month and we talk about what's happening and then answer questions and so forth try to keep everybody engaged uh and then just through social media and so forth you know our our different uh either our website or facebook or you know whatever snapchat all that other things that we use just to try to communicate all the values and so forth yeah it's, it's an ongoing process i'm sure you have to constantly be putting out content and uh, coordinating messaging so it's not easy. Well, even this through this, you know, COVID thing, it, you know, we had continued doing that. Um, that's where we we uh, we had a Facebook website for our employees, but we expanded it and we just keep communicating with them and how they could get, you know, whether they're on unemployment or whatever is happening and then just how things keep changing. You know, what are the, uh, you know, with the governor's office, you know, you know with restrictions lifting or new ones or so forth like that. It's just a constant thing. So we cheat, we got to keep communicating that and how we do things. Uh, it was, I know it was a really difficult decision to close. I was there that weekend of March 13th through 15th and I uh, actually skied with my son, Craig and right. his girlfriend. And um, the conditions were so amazing. It was just like so painful that the season had to come to an end oh, so abruptly. We had so much snow in April and <laughs> so know. much in May. And we're actually, it was a great season because all of our holiday periods were really good this year. You know, if we don't have a good Christmas period or MLK or whatever, you're kind of behind for the year. But we hit MLK, um, you know, uh, winter break and Christmas all were great. And we had some rain and so forth, but it didn't hit the, the holiday periods. And, you know, reggae, I think, would have been awesome because we had a foot of snow before reggae. So it just, you know, it is what it is. It, w it would happen. But, yeah, it would have been an awesome year in terms of, uh, you know, revenue and just skiing. Yeah, well, I think that's the mark of a strong leader is that you're resilient and that, you know, you you can't get overly emotional about, you know, something that is outside of your control. Right. And, well, but... that's the ski industry. <laughs> I know. It's weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes um, people say using the terms ski and business together. <laughs> it's like it is a very difficult business. And as we said previously, it's it's such a highly complex business. There's so much to it. I mean, you're running a hotel. And uh, how many condos do you have there now? Uh, there's... We we managed uh, well. There's homeowners associations. We managed about thirty two of those um, homeowners associations, and then there there are different kinds of configurations of hotels or townhouses and so forth. But uh, in the rental in our rental program, we had about two hundred and fifty in the rental program. And then the hotel, there's one hundred and twelve rooms that we manage. Um, but just like we were talking about earlier with the uh, with the internet and so forth, people are now you know renting on their own. So we have less and less of those, or every year we have less, uh, which is okay. Um, it used to be probably back when you were there it was you know it was uh, uh, and even up to about eight years ago, it was ski and stay packages that drove most people up there. But now people are able to shop online and they can get their own lodging and, and then their own, you know, ski product or, or whatever else they want to do lessons and so forth. They can shop kind of a la carte. And so that's kind of where it's moving at least in, but we still have groups and the groups want to come and, you know, uh, stay together. So we still need those basic, you know, condo units and so forth to accommodate for groups and things, but it's definitely been changing, you know, in the last 10 years or so. I remember, you know, my family used to stay in a condo on Walden Circle, actually, when I was in high school. And I remember one time we were, my two brothers and my parents and I were all asleep in our condo. And a, a bus arrived from Boston, like at midnight or something. And I somehow, 
<laughs> they thought our condo was their condo, <laughs> and all these people started walking in, <laughs> and we were, you know, my parents were in their pajamas, was like, no, sorry, you've got the wrong unit. I'll never forget that. <laughs> That's funny. It only happened that once. Though. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you know, that, that otherwise <laughs> would not happen. Uh, so, Carl, how do you involve employees and stakeholders in decision making so everybody feels like they have their say? Well, one thing that we do is we do uh, extensive surveying. We have a guest survey that um, anybody that comes and stays with us receives that automatically when they uh, depart. And we also have ambassadors going around collecting emails for so we can send these surveys out. And um, and we use those extensively. We look at them every week, how we're doing. We track them. Um, it, it basically, the one thing that we look at is um, it's uh, would you recommend Sugarloaf to your friends? Um, and that goes back to, you know, the basic marketing of word of mouth is the strongest marketing that you have. So we're judged on that um, collectively through Boyne. And I want to say Sugarloaf has won that for the last, I think, uh, the last eight years we've won it seven times. So uh, that just shows how passionate our employees are because they're taking that passion and, you know, excluding it out to, you know, our, our, our guests. And the guests are seeing that and they're just say, yeah, I, want, I, want, I would recommend this place to anybody, you know. And we have our challenges. You know that. It gets a little cold sometimes, and the wind can blow. But through all that, they still love coming there, which is amazing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, I mean, part of the reason that the snow is so good is because it's cold, and you need cold to have good snow. And, of course, the mountain is north-facing, yeah. which means that the snow lasts longer in the spring as well. I think in April we might have some of the best skiing conditions in the United States. I think so too. And our our president Steve Kircher was doing a podcast as well, and the, and one of the questions they asked him was, "What's your five favorite ski days in the last five years?" And he said one was up um, in France, you know, because he went out there on vacation. Uh, Big Sky, he said, was was another one, and then he said the other three were at Sugarloaf. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And another fact about Sugarloaf is that the vertical drop the amount of skiable ter- terrain is very comparable to anything at the big mountains out absolutely. west. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So even though the the summit at 4237 feet isn't as tall <laughs> as some mountains out west, the amount you ski down 2637 feet which is the same. See, now I can as- tell you we're in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Memorized all those numbers. <laughs> it's part of my DNA. I know I'll that, never forget. I think we're four feet lower than Killington or some crazy number. Oh, right? yeah. Killington, <laughs> Schmillington. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do have to say my son, Jamie, coached at Killington Mountain School. And um, so I I won't disparage right. our friends in Vermont. <laughs> so, Tell us about the plans for the future of Sugarloaf, and how have you communicated that? Well, we made a big announcement last winter. Um, it's our 2030 plan. We had done a 2020 plan, which is a 10-year plan, um, you know, back in 2010, obviously, and um, worked through that. We accomplished a lot of the things that we wanted to do through that plan. So we got together as a group again with uh, corporate people, Stephen Kircher, and a couple of advisors that we used in the past, Um and we came up with the 2030 plan, which uh, we've, we've announced, and it's on our website. So if you want to go through it, it, it outlines um, all, the, all the ideas that we think we're doing. But one of the big, biggest things that we're going to do, and we're starting to work on it now, is uh, West Mountain expansion. So it's about 240 or 540 acres of, um, of land that we're going to develop with real estate. We're going to put a new lift in there and ski terrain. And it kind of abuts some of our current parking lots as well and put a new parking lot so you can be able to ski right out from the parking lot on to get on this lift and ski around. And then with the new RFID ticketing that we have, you wouldn't even have to go to the base lodge. You can just hop in and go ski out of, out of the, out of the uh, uh, parking lots and ski back to the parking lots too. And we're also looking at putting a, a tubing park in there. Um, and then eventually we're going to add uh, mountain biking uh lift service mountain biking, which would take you up to Bullwinkle. So it's really exciting. And 
you know, that footprint is as big as some of the resorts out in Vermont. So it's it's a huge uh, piece of real estate that we're going to develop, and I'm really excited about it. Along with that, we're looking at possibly working with the town. Um, I don't know. You know that the town owns the golf course and the outdoor center and Nordic Center, and then we they we lease it back from them. So it's a great partnership they have. We're looking at you know putting in a, a nine hole golf course there too, par three above where the curtain one is, um, which would just activate that whole side of the mountain. That whole you know it's going to be uh, it's just going to be fantastic. It's a huge. It's probably it's the biggest thing. I don't know. You would know. Uh, since Super Quad, I guess, you know, that, that, that's happened there. So we're very excited about it. We've done, we're doing the uh, work right now for doing the permitting and hopefully we'll just get started on the engineering and so forth to get the uh, real estate part going. That's very, very exciting. I'm yeah. so glad that Sugarloaf has so much to announce. You, talking about West Mountain reminds me of uh, or, when I orchestrated the grand opening of the golf course, actually, and Margaret Chase Smith was there, and I think Governor Joseph Brennan was our governor, and he hit some balls off the first tee, and the first ball he hit to the left, and the second ball he hit to the right, and and then he hit it down the middle. And Margaret Chase Smith said, just like a politician, you know? <laughs> sometimes they're to the left and sometimes they're to the right. And you hope that they end up right down the middle. Oh, that's so funny. That was uh, quite a day. And actually, I remember Nana Weber, uh, who is Peter Weber's mother, and Kate Weber Punderson, who is headmaster of CVA now. Uh, yeah, she and Margaret Chase Smith were such good friends. And uh, so Nana with Weber was there to hang out with her friend. I think they had lunch together afterwards. That's great. Yeah. So um, it's really exciting that there's going to be so much going on at West Mountain. And uh, that will help with some of the congestion that sometimes happens in the base area there. And uh, Well, also, it's a, it's a, a lot of beginner and intermediate trails. So um, even though I think we have some of the best learning terrain in the East, um, you know, we're not we're more known for advanced terrain, but this will also bring in, uh, you know, a lot more intermediate terrain. And also the way that the the lift is going to be aligned, it will be below the tree level. So it probably won't go on wind hole as much or it'll be one of the last ones. <laughs> right. uh, we're looking at maybe a bubble, too. Um, so it will be warmer, not not susceptible to wind. And then, you know, for families, you know, kind of terrain or our, our new skiers. Yeah, intermediate skiers. That will be awesome because I know sometimes new skiers are nervous if they're on a trail and people are going fast by them. Or... Right. Well, if you go to the super quad, you got to go over chicken pitch somewhere. Right. So this new thing will have a new trail that goes around Bullwinkles. It's a true green trail. It, it won't have that pitch. Nice. So they'll have a green trail from the top of um, Timberline all the way back down to the base lodge and the new trail. Awesome. A real green trail. Right, exactly. <laughs> I remember one time my mother, who was a terminal intermediate skier, she came down the old narrow gauge headwall before the headwall had been modified. And uh, I'll never forget the look on her face because it, she was just terrified. <laughs> I think she probably still, now she's 87, I think she still could talk about it. <laughs> oh, I remember my oldest son, he was, first time he went down chicken pitch, he took off and, you know, he's snow plowing. And I hear the screaming. Oh, no. So I skied down next to him and he was just like screaming at a It was just, yeah. <laughs> I made it. Yeah, made it. <laughs> How much fun he was having. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, I still have a lot of photos of uh, Craig and Jamie up there <laughs> with their one-piece suits on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they probably don't want me to put those out on social media. Yeah, you should anyways. <laughs> so, Carl, you as a leader of such an iconic brand, you probably have to stay motivated yourself? And is there an app or a book or a course that has helped you to do your job better? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the obvious answer would be a weather app. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for something like Dale Carnegie right. or <laughs> I have a few the of those. Bible. <laughs> um, yeah, no, a absolutely. I think, um, you know, what I found, you know, the real secret to management is just it's people management, understanding people, how to motivate them psychology, you know, courses, that kind of thing. It's just trying to get everybody on the same page. Um, 
And I, I think if I asked, when anybody asked me, you know, what, you know, what is the, you know, what is the thing to be successful as a manager? I always say people management, understanding, listening, and then, you know, um, understanding what makes people tick or, you know, what drives them. And, so, and then you can work with them more. Um, uh, I, 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 those are the type of things I like, you know, um, but also I think just you have to understand your brand, obviously, um, and then how to market and sell it. That's very important, what you used to do. Uh, you have to know the, you know, the nuts and bolts of the business. You have to understand how operation works, F and B, all that kind of stuff. So you can not only understand it, how much, you know, supplies you need and costs and all that, but I have to manage people too in that way. So you, the, and I always thought that you'd have to, what I tried to do was learn how to do all those things so I can manage those people better. Because if I don't really know what they're doing, I can't really manage them and then I don't get their respect either. So, and then, and then at the end, you got to know how to read financial statements and, I call it scorekeeping, uh, you know, to, to see how you're doing and then how you can improve and what some things you need to do to change things for the ultimate, you know, trying to get the profit target that you're looking for, for investment. That's right. Yeah. So those are the type of things. So all those kind of disciplines, I would say that, you you know, either take courses or read books or so, you know, that kind of thing, um, uh, which I do constantly. And uh, actually, Stephen Kircher always is suggesting new books for us to read because he's very he loves to you know read and invest in those type of th- um you know help, helpful things for managers and so forth so we're doing that constantly and, uh, and I enjoy it I really do that's great you're juggling a lot of things at the same time so I admire you for that what is the best place for our listeners to connect with you Carl well I'm usually you know Going around the resort somewhere, you bump into me. <laughs> <laughs> I try to go like we were talking about earlier, just to you know, people can see me or my employees can see me around the resort. But also, the right through the website, uh, our website, there's a there's a place to connect with uh, management, so you can send emails that way. And then you know, I'll read them and look at them and uh, and and connect back with you. And of course, you have the amazing Sarah Strunk. Yes, I do. Who helps you? Yes. <laughs> and I just think she is the most wonderful human being on the planet. <laughs> she deals with a lot of different characters, including me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, kudos to you for uh, for having Sarah on your team. Well, this has been so fun, Carl. I really enjoy it, and um, I'd love to do another episode maybe up there at the mountain next winter, so I'll look forward to to having you back. Sounds good. You know, you got to just connect with Sarah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I know how to get in touch with you. (laughs) Sstrunk at (laughs) sugarloaf.com. Well, thanks, Carl. And I hope everybody enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And I hope you have a great day, PR Maven Nation. That's it for this week's episode. I'd like to thank you for listening. And if you feel that you've gotten value out of today's conversation, consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes or whatever app you're using to tune in. If you haven't subscribed yet, you should do so. I release a new episode each week and subscribing will make sure you get an alert when there's a new episode. You can also join the PR Maven Nation by going to prmaven.com slash nation and clicking join. It's free and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you have an Alexa-enabled device, be sure to add the PR Maven Marketing Minute to your daily flash briefing menu. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.